of Colombian coffee beyond the daily green, which we have organized and prepared with the kind support of the Specialty Coffee Association of Ireland. This conversation takes place in the framework of the Colombian coffee in Ireland, a series of events that we have organized at the embassy by taking the opportunity of the celebration of the International Day of uh, Coffee Day uh, as around the world. Uh, the origin of, uh, I want to share with you that the origin of the idea of this event came up in our search for a good cup of, of coffee, ideally Colombian, during the lockdown. I'm sure that we were not the only ones missing, you know, our favorite spots for a good cup of coffee. So we look at different and creative ways to, to find it, to get it, the best coffee, the best Colombian coffee that we could, could get it. And we really hope that it's an opportunity for all coffee lovers to meet. And this is actually our main idea today. Regardless of the way you drink it or you brew it or the method of soy, uh, we all have something in common. We all love coffee or we are very interested in coffee. And beyond that, we are aware of what means coffee for our farmers, for the livelihoods that, you know, all those families that depend on this special crop for the meaning of sustainability and the local community. So this conversation, today's conversation, will be a lot on, the, on that exactly, on the past, present, and future of Colombian coffee, and not only about the business opportunity, but as well on the sustainability on the, and the positive impact when we are talking about coffee in local communities. Let me introduce uh, you to our special guest and moderator. Uh, Julia Murray. Julia is the events coordinator of the Specialty Coffee Association of Ireland in Ireland. She also works as the head of the coffee development at the Gather and Gather. Julia, thank you for sharing uh, for sharing this event today, and uh, we really we are glad that you are joining us. And the floor is all yours. Thank you so much, Patricia. Um, it's great to be here and I was really honored to be invited and, you know, hope that I do a good job. I'm going to introduce our three panelists and the first uh, person to introduce is Andrew Willis, co-founder of Caro Coffee Shop. Andrew and his wife, wife Paola are coffee enthusiasts and founders of a small roasting business located in Caro Gary Farm beside the Atlantic Ocean in County Sligo in Ireland a beautiful part of the world. Their passion for coffee grew in Colombia where they lived for four years. And their time there coincided with a boom in specialty coffee production as farmers put greater emphasis on flavor and volume. Keen to stay in the world of setting up their own roasting. And while in Colombia, Andrew developed numerous contacts with coffee growers there, exporters and industry experts and started roasting coffee on his Hooky, and I am hope I'm saying that correctly, Hooky, Hooky, uh, 500 hooky. in the attic. <laughs> Say it again, Andrew. Hooky. Hooky in the attic. Hooky, I think. Yeah. <laughs> of his apartment in Bogota. And Andrew is now a certified Q grader and has taken courses in roasting and barista skills with the Specialty Coffee Association. So go, go you, Andrew. Next up, we have Flor, Flor Bentacor. She's Trade and Operations Manager at the European Office of the Federación Nacional de Cafeteros de Colombia, the National Federation of Coffee Growers of Colombia. Founded in 1927 by Colombia coffee growers, the Federation is a democratic and non-profit organization and an active advocate of more than 540,000 small producers. That's a lot. And it's the largest exporter of Colombian coffee in the world. Flor has been working for coffee in coffee for 16 years, all of them with the Federation. She was born in Quindío, one of the most traditional coffee regions of Colombia, and she comes from a family of coffee growers, so coffee goes way beyond just her job. She also holds an EMBA and her background is in industrial engineering, and she is passionate for coffee and profoundly proud to work for the Colombian coffee growers. Flor, you're very welcome. Thank you very much, Julia. Thank you. And last but not least, we have Alejandro, Alejandro Cadena, and he is co-founder of the CEO of Caravella Coffee. Very welcome, and, and Alejandro. 
Um, he's been working in the specialty coffee sector for over 15 years. From Bo He's from Bogota, Colombia, where he currently resides. He graduated as an economist and worked in finance, but he quickly moved to entrepreneurship. In 2009, he created Caravella Coffee, an important company in vertically integrating the sourcing, exporting and importing of green coffee. And his main goal was to incentivize growers to produce high quality coffee in an industry that at the time paid the same price, irrespective of quality, you know, prioritizing volume over quality. Today, Caravella Coffee imports and exports green coffee responsibly, sourcing coffee from eight countries in Latin America, importing it directly and transparently to specialty roasters in Asia, Australia, Europe and North America. Some feet. Well, very welcome, Alejandro. Thank you, Julia. Pleasure to be here with all of you today. So this is going to be a, hopefully a great chat and a discussion and we're all going to learn a lot more about Colombian coffee. I know that I have in doing my little bits of research and looking at maps and just delving a little bit further into Colombian coffee, which of course I've been drinking for many, many years. We're going to kick it off with a few questions for the panelists. Um, Andrew, if I can start with you. So you, you mentioned on your website that you experienced the boom of specialty coffee in Colombia. Can you tell us more about that and what did you encounter that made you put journalism aside and dedicate yourself to coffee? In fact, if you can also tell us what you were reporting on, what kind of journalism you were doing, because I think that's interesting too. Um, good afternoon, Julia. Good afternoon, Ambassador. Good afternoon, um, all the spectators watching us today. Um, so, so yes, I was in uh, living in, in Bogota for a relatively short amount of time, uh, four years. Um, but over that, over those four years, I really saw um, a change in uh, the language that coffee producers were using uh, and also the availability of good coffee, a good cup of coffee in Bogota, uh, the capital city where I lived. Um, my job was a a commodities reporter for Bloomberg News and so as part of that work I had to go out to coffee farms uh, and interview coffee farmers um, and see what was on their mind um, and what was really driving their their different businesses um, and over those four years I could see this change in language from one of pure production to increasingly one of production but also flavour. So more and more farmers were um, experimenting with different varieties and um, not just Tipica, uh, Catura, Castillo, which are all great coffees, but also increasingly some of them were starting to use uh, Geisha or Gesha, um, depending on how you pronounce it. Um, so that was an interesting development. And also some of them were starting to to experiment with the, the processing techniques. Colombia is obviously very famous uh, and rightly so for its delicious washed coffees. Um, but increasingly, um, you can find uh, honey processed coffees and even natural coffees from Colombia. Um, and these farmers are doing that to experiment with the flavor profile um, that they can, they can generate. One of the last farmers that I interviewed uh, in the Sierra Nevada mountains, right at the top of um, Colombia on the, the Caribbean coast, said he was pulling down all his old trees and he was going to plant 100% uh, geisha variety, which is quite a high risk strategy because the geisha is a slightly more vulnerable uh, coffee variety. It doesn't have such a strong root network. Um, but this man obviously felt that it was the, the best way to um, uh, support his, his family. So that was an interesting development. At the same time, in Bogota, when I arrived in, in 2013, it was quite difficult to get a really, really good cup of coffee. Um, you know, I found maybe one or two cafes where they were weighing the dose, timing the espresso shots, maybe serving pour over uh, preparations. And by 2017, when I left, um, the number would be, you know, well over 20 and, and climbing rapidly. So there was a change on the production level and also on the consumption level. Um, and I, I found that fascinating. And it was also opening my own ideas, uh, my own eyes to 
how how delicious and how varied coffee could taste. And I felt um, it was time for me to try and to work in the coffee industry. So that's um, when I decided to move back to Ireland and, and set up Carol Coffee Roasters. Super. And I say that was I'd say that was a, a fast learning curve to be actually living in Colombia and traveling around and seeing all of these different processes. It's it's something that the rest of us in the coffee business would only be envious of to to have that time and that proximity. We are often as consumers so far removed from the farm. And, uh, you know, that was that was great learning for you. Flor, can I come to you with a question and just say, just ask maybe what are the best attributes do you feel of Colombian coffee like what do you following on from what Andrew has said and you know how much he got to enjoy coffee there what do you think are some of the best attributes well I think uh, when you think about uh, Colombian coffee you really have to think about quality and that is absolutely uh, the the driver uh, of 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 Colombian uh, coffee uh, but uh, beyond that uh, you know uh, the umbrella, let's say, of, of, of quality has five very important com components, and that is is very key uh, for 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 uh, quality. One is uh, the the plant varieties, and that is uh, something that Colombia has a very strong uh, foothold with the development of uh, uh, the the well the Colombia variety, and uh, that is uh, Castillo and Sin Cafe One that are. Uh, highly productive that are um, that have a very good uh, cup profile and that also are, are rust uh, resistant. So that is, of course, one one type. But uh, as uh, Andrew well mentioned, they, there are other uh, varieties in Colombia. Um, so the second one is the environment. We have a very uh, rich uh, diversity. Uh, and that comes uh, because of uh, the three mountain ranges uh, that we have and also because we are in a very specific location in the equator so we, we can have our, our crops all, all year round and also the different altitudes we have from 1200 meters to 2200 meters which gives a very uh, broad uh, uh, what diversity on the cup files that you can uh, find. Um, and then it's uh, of course uh, as well the uh, the farming and uh, that comes uh, our, our coffee growers. Uh, we have uh, uh, the ninety six percent of the those four uh, over five hundred coffee growers uh, have less than um, than five hectares. So we are talking about smallholders that are dedicated to coffee growing, and they do it with a lot of care in, and a lot of care for quality. So this is a, an absolutely uh, uh, for for Colombian coffee, and then is uh, is the harvesting, and uh, this is uh, as well uh, something that that tells also about uh, well the experience of of, of Colombia being uh, a producing uh, country, and uh, we have more than three hundred years of history uh, as producers, more than two hundred years of uh, being exporters, um, and of course uh, it's. Uh, it's uh, this knowledge uh, it, it, there that comes also with uh, with the world of specialty with uh, experimentation that leaving the the beans uh, longer in the trees so there is a, a lot also uh, to offer harvesting and the processing uh, uh, that uh, we we are um, well very uh, keen on taking care of every step of, of the process. Uh, uh, as also Andrew mentioned, we're, we're mostly uh, a country with uh, of wash arabica uh, co coffees. We're the, the largest uh, uh, producer of uh, wash arabica, but of course we have also the, the honeys, the, the 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 naturals, and there is also well a lot of of, of diversity there uh, to to explore. So all all in all, it's um, it is uh, five five things: plant varieties, environment farming, harvesting, processing, and uh, all this together uh, makes it uh, a, a, well, the, the Colombian coffee is, uh, has a, a very strong uh, foothold uh, for any roaster uh, to use. And, and, and I think the key key point is, is the, the diversity. We have uh, over 222 uh, 
regions. Uh, they come uh, with different attitudes. Uh, it is uh, well, diversity, diversity. You can find every coffee, every taste you want. You can find it uh, in Colombia. What a great stuff. That's a comprehensive answer. And I'm currently drinking Tabby. Are you familiar with Tabby? Absolutely. Yeah, and that's my first time having it. So I'm really enjoying it. And thank you. Alejandro, just do you have anything to add there in terms of the attributes of Colombian coffee? And what's your take on what Andrew and Flor have said so far? Do you think they're, well, they're getting it? Sure. Well, I think I think Andrew and Flor have said some many good things about what makes Colombia coffee special. I would uh, probably add to that that one one thing that really characterizes Colombian coffee growers is, is their passion for for coffee. They really live uh, thanks to coffee, uh, and that's something that you you hardly find uh, anywhere else. You know, this is this is a, a, a crop that has been cultivated for uh, over 300 years in Colombia. So we're talking about that most farmers are four, fifth, sixth generation farmers. So they have coffee in their blood, and that brings a lot of passion to the business. It's not just a, 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 a crop that they grow. It's actually their livelihood in, in the, the full sense of that word. And that brings a lot of passion to, to, the, to the business, which is what really uh, we think makes makes uh, very special. You know, there, there are many countries in the world that have great varieties, that have uh, great climates. Um, of course, Colombia is, is very diverse, as, as Flores mentioned, and that brings diversity to, to, uh, to the cup profile. But if you didn't have that many passionate coffee growers, and, and these are small older farmers that work together with their families, uh, their wife, the children, it's, it's really a family business that has a lot of passion to it. And that, that is the real difference, I, I believe, in, in terms of Colombian coffee, is that passion that really shines through the cup. You know, it, it, it's, it's something that you, do, you really don't find uh, that, that often in somewhere else. And then perhaps the other thing that I would add is, of course, the, the research and the, the technical um, uh, assistance that, that the FNC has provided, that, that is, is something that is, is, is key as well. Uh, when you go to other countries, you don't see that, that, that much uh, attention to detail. You really, you know, we work in, in seven other Latin American countries and, and it, in the work that our uh, PECA educators have to do in other countries uh, of convincing, of, 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 of really educating those farmers is a lot more harder than what you really find in Colombia. Most most producers, especially the smallest ones and they're the ones that are really fourth fifth generation farmers, when you start working with them, their, their cup can easily be the first time they bring it to our labs, 82, 83. In other countries, it's it's harder to find those 82s, 83s in the first first pass. Uh, it probably takes four or five times for them to really understand and, 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 and do the, the, the drying properly, the 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 wet milling and the fermentation process uh, well done and I think that that is also part of the the work that FNC and Seneca have, have done for for many years is of educating farmers and really making sure that they follow some of the best practices in the world. Yeah, and it's interesting what you say, um, and I think there's an onus if if it's a family a family run business, there's an onus that's felt a lot more from producers if it goes back generations, like you say. And I know that as well. My husband works very closely with wine and some of the best wines come from you know, the wine houses of generations and generations of families. I know I'm having problems with my camera. I don't think you can see me, but as long as you can all hear me, that's kind of OK. <laughs> I'm trying to get it <laughs> sorted. <laughs> um, Andrew, did you have Julia, can I just. Yeah, I just wanted to. Um, just make a point on uh, what Alejandro was saying there uh, and you were saying about um, the advantages that come from uh, many of these coffee farms being family businesses. I mean, one of the key determinants in whether uh, coffee will taste good or, or otherwise is whether the fruit, the cherry, is picked at the right moment. Um, and, you know, coffee pickers generally tend to be paid by weight. Um, and so there's an incentive to pick all the cherries on the branch ripe cherries, but also underripe cherries. Mm. If it's a family business, everyone is working for the family business. And so it's much e easier to uh, have a picking team who are picking only the ripest uh, cherries, and that will be reflected in a superior cup of coffee. So it's another advantage of uh, family uh, coffee thinkers. 
You mean, Andrew, as opposed to uh, migrant workers who would travel around farms? Yeah, and I mean, obviously, uh, migrant workers pay, play a, a big role in the, the picking of coffee cherries in Colombia and uh, many other Latin American countries. And, um, th you know, if they're paid correctly, they can do a fantastic job. Uh, but there is an advantage when it's your cousins or your sons or your daughters who are picking. There's this extra incentive uh, on them to pick only the ripest cherries so that the coffee really expresses its maximum potential. And I'm curious now, just I'm going to ask a question that's unscheduled, but it, you know, in wine vineyards, when it's the first pressing and the first tasting of the wine celebration, with if it's, it's, if it's a good year, does the same thing happen with coffee? Do they taste their crop all together each year, each harvest and celebrate it? Or do they kind of know it's going to be good? Not really. I, I wouldn't say it's similar to the wine. Of course, wine is very ancient uh, uh, beverage. Coffee has four, five hundred years. So, so there's not that much tradition and much celebration. You also have to remember that um, usually Colombian farmers in the past, this is changing, of course, in the last few, few uh, decades, but coffee farmers in the past didn't taste their own coffees. They would sell their best, the best, the best uh, part of the crop. They would sell it. You know, they would, they, they, they would, they want to get the highest price, of course. And if they sell the, the best coffee, they they, should, they usually get the highest price. They would usually just drink uh, their the seconds or the thirds. Yeah. Um, so that's that's changing, fortunately. But in the past, that that wasn't the case. So so there isn't that tradition that you find in in winemaking. Um, as as there as uh, in coffee, uh, unfortunately, but uh, you know things things change, and, and growers are now drinking more and more of the, their best crops, and and there's a lot of farmers as, uh, that are also roasting their own coffee and selling pounds of coffee, uh, and some even have coffee shops in in, in the, the small towns where they where they live, so things are changing for the better, I think. Right. Yeah, that all sounds wonderful. If I, if I may add to, to, to Alejandro, it is also the case, and then going to, into the uh, quality uh, focus, is uh, that nowadays uh, also coffee growers are learning to, to cup their own coffee and to, to identify the defects or the characteristics uh, that are good, the attributes that are related to the process. So they can also learn not, not only of uh, of the advice of of, of an agronomist, uh, but from what they can feel in the cup. So that is something that is uh, that is growing. That also we are FNC with uh, our agronomists are also uh, trying to 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 uh, well to, to to get the growers to be more involved. And this is a, a well a very important part of this new uh, in growing uh, specialty era. I can imagine there's been massive education in the last decade, certainly, and that's all helped all of that as well. Just, Andrew, for a second, come back to you as well. So when you left Ireland, went to Colombia, got to learn a bit more about coffee and you came back home, did you notice a big difference? Well, certainly, I suppose in the last, it's all relative people's standpoint, isn't it? I would say in the last 20 years, um, some of the questions have said, oh, the last 10 years. So has specialty coffee in Ireland changed in the last 15 years and what's your take on that do you think the Irish are seeking it and wanting it and knowledgeable enough to be do you know making it brewing it absolutely um well I, I actually left Ireland in 2007 just as the um, the recession was arriving um, and I, I went to Argentina and I eventually ended up in, in Colombia. So I worked my way um, upwards. So so really, I've been away for, you know, the best part of 15 years. And in some ways, that makes it easier to see the change in Irish coffee, uh, the Irish coffee scene. When I left, uh, you know, I sort of had this impression that um coffee was really an alternative to tea it was a sort of a plan b if you didn't want tea then we could offer you coffee and um, there was this quite widespread perception i think that uh, uh, coffee had a sort of homogenous flavor it all tasted the same and um, that tended to be quite bitter and um, you might need to add a lot of milk a lot of sugar to make it more drinkable 
Um, and fast forward to today, and I think there's a much greater appreciation that, you know, all coffee doesn't taste the same. Um, some of it can be quite fruity. Some of it um, can be quite acidic uh, in a positive sense. Um, you don't necessarily always have to add uh, milk to it, although, you know, you can if you want. Um, so I, I do think there's a much greater understanding um, in the Irish community um, about what coffee um, can really involve. And I think, you know, in some ways it's learned from the wine industry and um, more and more people want to know which country it's come from, which region, maybe the name of the farmer, uh, the, the varietal. Um, how it's been processed. I mean, we find um, with our packaging that we we have to put the altitude that it's grown at, uh, the coffee varietal, all, all this information because the consumer is requesting it. Um, so I think I think that's a fantastic change, a change for the good. Um, now, obviously, that can go you know further again. Um, I do think that uh, at the moment in Ireland, coffee, for one reason or another, is seen as quite a trendy um, product and, and it can be, you know, influenced by the minimalism of the bar uh, or the haircut of the barista, um, all, all these things, the beard. Um, and I just really kind of recommend to people that, you know, doesn't matter how good looking the barista is, um, just focus on the flavors that you're perceiving in the cup and um, that's the thing to look out for so so yeah ireland um it's come a huge distance in in the coffee um area and we can go even further great answer yeah and i often find and i and i i'm careful to say to our bar own baristas you might love the particular coffee that you're serving, you might love the story behind it and the origin and the varietal, etc. But you have to pick up on from the customer if they're ready to hear that, if they actually want all of that information. And I think, Andrew, that's kind of going back to sometimes I think those are too geeky <laughs> and they're too into it. And the, there's a bit of a blindside filter and the, the customer service element is just a blurb and not enough of a of a pickup on how the customer might be feeling. But yes, all of that side of the coffee is, um, is you know, what keeps us, part of what keeps us addicted to it. Um, Flor, just following on then, there's been a, a trend of coffee production all over the world from Central American countries, South Asia and passing through Africa. So the unique selling proposition of Colombian coffee specifically compared to other origins, what do you think you know, sets Colombia apart in this way? Well, def definitely, uh, if we could uh, group it in, in, in three parts, and one is uh, the tradition and the history uh, of uh, coffee in Colombia. Uh, we talked uh, about earlier that it's 300 years of growing coffee. Imagine the knowledge that you uh, put together in 300 years. Uh, 200 years exporting uh, and then for from the federation that is a uh, we're representing uh, more than half a million coffee growers uh, it was founded uh, almost 100 years ago um, so it's uh, these were uh, big numbers that uh, that tells that uh, the knowledge in Colombia about coffee is not improvised it didn't happen uh, because a hype is something that is very rooted to, to the Colombian history. Uh, well, the, the second um, is uh, that it is, coffee is very important for Colombia and that also, uh, uh, well, it manifests it, itself on, on, on how sustainable it, it is. And uh, it is 17% uh, of the agricultural uh, GDP. That's what uh, coffee uh, means for Colombia. Two, 0.7 million people uh, leave from be growing and this is 33 percent of all the rural population so this is massive uh, and of course we are uh, a country of small holders uh, where uh, where the the um, the sustainability factor is uh, it's uh, well 
very, very, very important and very well, very appealing for 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 the market. And well, in the last uh, but uh, not least is uh, uh, well the the, the size. Uh, we are the third uh, biggest producer of, of coffee in the world. Where the the largest in our coffee that it is known as uh, the high, highly regarded as a high quality coffee. Uh, we have access to to both oceans, to Atlantic and to the Pacific, which is very unique. Uh, the, the positioning of Colombia uh, would, would this uh, an advantage in terms of, of achievements, uh, uh, but also uh, well in, in, in terms of, of the logistics from the coffee region that that is all around uh, the mountain ranges, the three mountain ranges in in, in the Andes, and um, and then it provides fresh. A, a crop around the year. This is something very unique uh, of, of Colombia, and what we mentioned earlier that is uh, the the big diversity that uh, Colombia uh, has with its different attitudes, uh, altitudes, different uh, 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 climates, uh, different ecosystems is uh, uh, well extremely rich. You can have it. Or you're uh, around, and you have committed coffee growers uh, to well to do well uh, the job, and for sure to have an institution like uh, the FNC that would uh, uh, will make sure that the long-term investments, the long-term developments like uh, varieties, uh, research, uh, anything of research and developments that that help the process and the harvesting that uh, can. Uh, 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 well, help on, on quality. Anything is is uh, uh, well giving this backbone to to the coffee industry in Colombia. No, that's super and good. And just touching on the sustainability side of things, Alejandro, um, do you see more demand? I know that there's been an awful, uh, you know, or a great uh, quest for more knowledge about the terroir and the farm and the process, etc. Do you see more demand for? Uh, the people you're selling to uh, about for, sustain for sustainability and the good stories behind what's happening at farm level. Is that a thing that you that you get requested? Well, you know, when we started our business 20 years ago, uh, that was that was a, a key focus at the mo at the end, uh, those, you know, in the early 2000s, the focus on sustainability was how we can pay farmers better prices. Um, you know, back then, 2001, 2002, even 2003, the the, the C market, the, the the international price for coffee was around 40 cents. So it was it was pretty bad. It was probably um, as bad as it was uh, a year ago, a couple of years ago. Um, so back then, when we started our business, the focus for roasters was how how can we get uh, more money to the farmer, and that's that's crucial for sustainability. That's that if you, if you don't have farmers that are getting paid enough. To, to have a, a good living, a good standard of living, they won't be able to protect the environment, they won't be able to protect the, you know, the rivers and the streams, you know, they, they, will, they will be uh, having a hard time and, and uh, as a consequence, the environment and, and our, our planet is going to have a hard time. So that's, that's how we started a business, focusing on how to pay more money for the farmers and of course, uh, when you talk to, to roasters back then and talk to them today uh, as well, the focus was I want to pay more, but I also want to receive a better product. I'm not willing just to pay more for 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 a nice story. I really want a good product. And that's that's how Caravella started, you know, just focusing on the high quality to, to be able to pay farmers a better price. And, you know, when, when we started uh, in 2002 exporting coffee, uh, the market was 40 cents, as I said before. We were paying the farmers 130, 140. So you know it was three times, times more, and of course that really helped our business thrive very fast because of course farmers just wanted to, to sell to us. You know they were getting so much money that that uh, we didn't have to do any advertising or any re uh, reaching out to farmers because they just came to us because they wanted to get better, better prices. Of course, provided they met what criteria. May I interject? Oh, of course, we were we were uh, pioneers in, in in really cupping every single batch of coffee that we got, we got from farmers. You know that was the way that we could we could really guarantee the quality to the roasters because because you know they they wanted to see the product. And of course, if we if, when you're talking about half a million farmers, we're talking farmers that are delivering 200 kilos of parchment, so two bags of coffee. So to, in order to, to to guarantee the quality of every single. Uh, bag of coffee that 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 the roaster was buying, we had to basically uh, install cupping labs 
very close to the farmers so that we could cup every batch of coffee that they brought to us. And this has evolved a lot, you know, fair trade, organic, rainforest alliance, all those certifications have helped uh, push the, the concept of, of uh, environmental sustainability uh, forward to the consumer and, and of, of course to roasters. And of course, things have changed a lot since, since then. But the focus on really paying farmers more is what really uh, uh, drives most of specialty roasters. And that's key to sustainability. You can have organic coffee, but if they're not being paid enough, then that coffee will not be there here in, in 20, 30 years. You, you have to think that <coughs> coffee is a long-term crop. You know, when, when a farmer invests in, in planting a seed of coffee, he or she will not make money until the fifth or sixth years of production. So this, this is something that we need to, 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 to really uh, remind consumers. If you're just buying one cup of coffee today and then tomorrow you're not buying it, then that's not sustainable for any coffee grower out there. And, and that's why quality is so key as well, because if the consumer drinks a good cup of coffee, he will come back. He will, will want to come back to your cafe or to your roastery. And, and that's, that's what we all have to do in our industries to protect that quality, pay good prices to the farmers and term relations with those farmers that are doing the, the extra mile so that mm -hmm. we can all have a sustainable business in 20, 30, 40, 50 years. You know, hopefully our, our, grand, our granddaughters and grand, grandchildren can enjoy great cups of coffee in 50 years from now. Uh, and that's only possible if farmers are being paid a good price. Yeah, and I've recently, over COVID, I decided to do, do a bit of learning and the SCA Foundation course in sustainability. And it was very good. It was very illuminating. Um, there is an intermediate and a, and a professional level, which are quite high end, I believe. But I know that um, uh, Trish Ferguson, she's our sustainability coordinator for SCA here in Ireland. I know that she's on this call and, um, you know, she's, she's very knowledgeable. I'm sure she might come in with a question at the end about all of Julia, this. Can I? That's important. Go on, Andrew. Can, yeah, um, I just want to say that I, I completely agree with Alejandro. Um, it's absolutely crucial that uh, farmers are paid correctly for the hard work that they're doing and that it's uh, sustainable so they can feed their families. At the same time, um, I think it's just as important that farmers are looking after the soil when I'm not roasting coffee, I'm farming. We're growing organic vegetables just inside the window out there. Oh, I see from your and, website. Brilliant. And um, we can see the difference in a, two years, a really short period of time, the flavor difference when you look after the soil or when you don't look after the soil. Um, so I think in terms of flavor, uh, it's crucial that uh, the soil is dealt with correctly and also in terms of the longevity of the coffee industry and um, of course if farmers are not paid correctly they'll move into different areas but if the soil is not looked after if we have more and more floods droughts climate change then you know planet earth may not be able to support the coffee plantations that we need to supply our coffee demands so i think the two really go side by side um, and are of equal importance Absolutely. Um, may I just ask a question? Yeah. Well, you know, both have to go hand in hand. You can't, you can't ask a farmer to focus on the environment if he's not getting enough money to feed his family, right? So they're both in, uh, absolutely very important. And I, I couldn't agree more with, with Andrew. You know, you find places in Colombia like Nariño, which, which tends to be a, a drier uh, area of Colombia because it, it doesn't have the two harvests. It has have six months of dry season, six months of wet season, as opposed to many other regions of Colombia that have two, two dry seasons and two wet seasons during the year. And one of the things that really amazes me is that the, the farmers in Nariño have very bad soil conservation practices. And that's something that, that scares me because you're, you're talking about uh, farms that are really uh, hilly, really steep, and so erosion is a big issue. The, the, the soil conditions of generally in the south of Colombia are not as good as the ones that you find in the north of Colombia. They're more sandy soils, so they, they are more prone to erosion. Uh, and so you, you, do, you do wonder, you know, if they don't work on their soil conservation practices, they don't plant more shade trees, um, and they, do, they don't, you know, use as many agrochemicals. The Nariño coffee, which is one of the best in Colombia, won't be here in 20, 30 years. So, yes, that is the skill. And of course, you know, more shade is, is going to be important in some regions as, as the, the, the climate changes and you have more 
extreme weather is both drier and, and, and wetter. And then you also have to protect, uh, you know, the, the rivers and the streams, of course. So it, it all has to be very holistic. But again, my, my, my point was, if you don't pay them correctly, they won't have the, the, the resources and won't, have, won't even have the attention uh, to, to, to do the other stuff. So, so they all have to come hand in hand. And that, that's where education and, and, and good prices really help. If I, may, if I may jump in, because it is a very interesting uh, uh, topic, and I'm glad that Andrew, uh, Alejandro uh, touched upon it, and that is uh, that uh, the, well, the concept of co-responsibility, and that is, uh, well, first of all, uh, indeed, the coffee grower uh, need to take care of, of themselves. That is like the, the, the primate uh, uh, survival mode, let's say. And uh, what we what we heard often, and that uh, and then we like to to mention it here, is that biggest uh, predator uh, of uh, the environment is uh, poverty. So uh, indeed, first and most is uh, to take care of, of of the people that is uh, that is a uh, very core to to our mission uh, at NC. and then once uh, the coffee growers have not only uh, means to 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 have a living but uh, to strive uh, then the environment will follow then uh, more productivity will follow then they would uh, get in, get more investments into their farms then uh, get more out of it and then also well get more in, in, in return so it's it's indeed uh, um, a cycle and the responsibility of all the coffee sector not only of the coffee grower but everybody in the supply chain from from uh, you know from 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 the roasters from the supermarkets from everyone is uh, co-responsible that uh, well that this cycle keeps being uh, sustainable yeah and i heard a great uh... Just a great simple comment the other day from the sort of consumer end of things. Coffee should never be given for free. And I liked that. I was like, absolutely. And maybe it's been said a hundred times before, but it was my first time hearing it. And I thought, absolutely, we need to charge and we need to tell the story and we need to make sure that, you know, that people are getting properly paid for the great jobs that they do. Just um, thinking about the future of coffee, what it, um, Alejandro, maybe coming to you, what, what's next? Where next? Where do you think what challenges and opportunities are there for? Oh, uh, where do I start? You know, there's <laughs> lots of challenges. Um, of course, climate change is a big challenge. We've already talked about that. Um, that's something that you know, as as Flora already mentioned, it's, it's not only the responsibility of the coffee farmer or the roasters. It's it's all uh, the, the six billion or seven billion citizens. Are, it's our responsibility to 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 work on that, uh, and governments as well. Um, I think there are two main challenges that we haven't spoken about. One thing, one is generational change. You know, uh, we've had really bad prices for a number of years, and uh, and and that is driving a lot of farmers out of out of the business. Um, and not really the, the 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 fathers or the grandfathers. It's actually the 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 the, the, the kids and the, those grandchildren that are not looking forward to being a coffee coffee grower. It, it, it was not sustainable. They don't want to be living the lives of their parents. They want a, a better life. And, and, and some of them are looking for, for you know, um, going to the cities and, 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 you know, being taxi drivers or, you know, rapi tenderos in Colombia or somewhere else, right? They make more money out of that. They might have a, a harder lifetime in the, in the city, but they're making more money. Uh, and that's, that's a big concern. We, we, we need farmers, the, the sons and daughters of, of, of today's coffee farmers to stay in the business. And that that's that's key, and that's only possible if we can make that a, an attractive and sustainable and, and profitable uh, en enterprise. If, if that's not there, then you know, that million farmers in years will probably have two hundred thousand farmers. Um, so that's one thing, and and that goes hand in hand with with the other challenges is is, is coffee prices, right? Um, today, more or less, farmers are are, are making good money uh, thanks to the exchange rate primarily. Uh, that that's that's been very helpful for farmers, but that's not you can't rely on the exchange rate to, to be profitable. You have to rely on the final price of your product, um, and and that's that's the other key key issue. You know, how can you make coffee farmer profitable so that you know they 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 make they stay in the business and 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 they can live uh, properly. 
So I, I would say that those two are, are big challenges. Those challenges are not easy, uh, and they're 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 tied together. And even climate change is is is, is part of the whole pricing. I, I'm sorry to be so insistent on the, on the pricing, but but it's definitely the major uh, aspect that we have to address, and that that goes hand in hand with with how the value is 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 uh, distributed among the supply chain you know there's been multiple studies that say farmers get only five percent of the overall retail value of coffee that's very little you know and wine is a lot bigger mm -hmm. and most agricultural product is a lot bigger so how do we get more a, be a better distribution of that uh, that overall retail value of coffee to the farmers and of course it starts with paying the farmer more but also you mentioned it uh, you know, we shouldn't give out free coffee. We should be charging a lot more money in the cafes and in the retail bags for coffee. It, it, it's, it's a very cheap product, especially if you consider the amount of hand labor that is involved in coffee. If, if you look at a coffee farm, there's only one single piece of machinery in the whole process. The pulper, which was invented 300 years ago. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's the only piece of equipment that you really have. The rest is all hand labor. The fermentation side is, is you know, it's all very manual. You, if you want to do it properly, you have to really look at it and really uh, do it, you know, with, with experience. The, all the drying, you know, the amount of raking and, and, and moving of the coffee during, you know, 10, 15, 20 days that it takes you to dry coffee is, is, is significant. And just talk about the picking, you know, uh, it's it's all manual labor, in, at least in Colombia and in most uh, washed our engines. And that's that's that, that's another aspect. You know, there are there aren't that many pickers out there, you know, people willing to go and, and, and pick green, uh, coffee from the, you know, from this really hilly side and then do it properly. Just the, the, the ripe, the red ripe beans. So it, for the amount of manual labor. It's 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 really it's really cheap product, and you know we've done cost of production studies, and, and the cost of production are just going up and up and up. Why? Because seventy percent of the cost of producing coffee are, are labor costs, and as, as as you all know, labor is something that the farmer cannot control. The cost of labor is 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 dictated by very strong market forces that that the farmers cannot control. So the the cost of producing coffee is only going up in the next few years. And, and that's something that we need to, to, to really uh, take into account. Uh, and consumers need to know this. They, they need to know that, you know, as opposed to other agricultural products that are now being ma mechanically harvested, mm. coffee is still manual harvest and there's a lot of manual labor in there. And I think, I think there's that the coffee, um, the, the consumer and the things and people on coffee bars, I think there's a disconnect and I think there's still a long way to go. I think still when you say to some people, you know, coffee comes from a tree. They're like, what? <laughs> so all these wonderful pieces of, you know, work that you're talking about that happens at farm level is, is often not known by the, the general public. Yes, there are those people who are into specialty coffee and they seek it and they want all the story and, you know, to know more. There are so many people who, who don't even know, don't even know the country of the coffee that they're drinking and where it's, you know, where it's come from. So I think there's a disconnect there, and I think we need to get better at telling that story somehow um, right. on coffee bars. And I know I mentioned before on uh, uh, on our practice call on Monday, I think uh, I think it's it's in its infancy, but I think it has a ways to go where people can maybe scan a code or get the information from the the back of the grinder on the bar, and it leads them, uh, you know, somewhere where they can see the full transparency of the journey that that coffee has been on. You know that that we need better mechanisms there as an industry too. Right. Um, is there any more um, anything any of the rest of the panelists want to say before we before I want to just show you a little thing that I did um, before coming on this call? I posed a question on Instagram, and it was uh, basically asking people where is the best coffee uh, that they've ever had in Colombia from. And these are some of the answers that I got. I couldn't put them, didn't have time to put them all on it. But I just thought it was a good way for me to learn a bit more about the spread of coffee in Colombia. And I have. And I've looked at all of these little origins and I've tried pronouncing all of the names. And these are just some of the answers that we got. 
and I'm sure some of our panelists have had some of these coffees and I have too and the ones I haven't I'm going to make it my mission to to order and to try and get if they're still available I know whoosh whoosh isn't um but I don't wonder if any of our panelists have had any of these coffees apart from yours Andrew Caro coffee roasters are any of you familiar well, with any of those of course I've had La Terrera that's one of the coffees that we've we've uh, we source for uh, 3FE and and has been in the UK uh, I, it's interesting to see that they have the ca decaffeinated version, which is quite good. But I think something that strikes um, very strongly here is uh, you've got Katurra, Tavi, Mocha, Wush Wush, Gesha. So, you know, it's very interesting to see that there is quite a, a wide diversity, not only of, of, of regions, Tolima, Huila, uh, Cauca, but also of, of varieties, which is it's great to see that. Uh, roasters in Ireland are, are really looking looking for for great tasting coffee and and most likely because of those varieties willing to pay very good prices for them. Yeah, absolutely. Some of them are not uh, are, are are not cheap, which is good. <laughs> and I wonder, um, Flora, have you had any of those? Yeah, well, I just uh, uh, well not exactly from the specific uh, farms, but on a personal note, uh, my my mother is from Marsella, Risaralda. And uh, the form from my mother's side, uh, uh, her parents are in uh, what well, was in, in in Marseilla. So I've drunk coffee from 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 the area, from the very specific area, and uh, and well, and then of course uh, from uh, well, Pitalito Villa is a very uh, it's a it's uh, well, it's the biggest. Uh, uh, pr a producer municipality in in Colombia, um, so so yes, not a, not precisely for from from this precise exact uh, uh, farms, but for sure from from the municipality and right. and, and then and we're great that you got uh, such a specific uh, uh, feedback in and 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 then uh, about what you mentioned that. Uh, uh, what we wanted to to comment, perhaps a, a last uh, comment from my side is that, uh, and, and about the knowledge of the uh, consumers, is that uh, we uh, uh, in Colombia are very keen that the consumers know much more about Colombian coffee. And when you have such a beautiful his, uh, history and story to tell, and we have uh, so much to offer, the only that you can wish is that to show it to the world and that everybody knows. Uh, we have transparency we have traceability uh, as Alejandro was mentioning we're very key in, in Colombia to be very transparent on, on, on pricing and uh, we're very key on quality uh, old in the in the process what Andrew was also mentioning that uh, he uh, put it puts uh, uh, the process in the in the in the pack uh, and all all the information is for the world uh, to take and when you are built in such strong pillars of of sustainability and and so so much nice beautiful stories to tell you can only wish that the world knows more well we'll all be shouting about it after this for sure i'm just going to read a couple of comments that were in the chat if that's okay uh roger an ambassador ambassador of SCA here in Ireland says super interesting what Andrew is saying about soil health. We hope that seeing coffee farmers get a, getting access to tools that would allow them to assess their soil health and maybe education to improve too. Tim Windlebow is doing a great job in Colombia, which I follow as well with his project Finca El Suelo. I'm not sure if I'm saying it correctly there, where the coffee growing uh, is using biological farming. I have one, uh, our first question for the panel, if you're ready. Um, Linda Brophy, who I work with, is asking, uh, what are the most unusual processing or practices you know about in Colombia at farm level? What, what kind of wacky things have you seen, I think, is what she's asking. Ooh, there's, you know, today there's lots of different processes being uh, experimented at the farm level. Um, there's all sorts of uh, anaerobic or carb carbonic maceration uh, processes being experimented. Some are doing a great job. Most, unfortunately, are not doing a great job. It, it's 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 not only very expensive to do uh, anaerobic processes, but also very very difficult. One 
key thing about anaerobic processes or, or is that you need to control the temperature and, and sometimes temperature is not controlled so you end up killing the embryo of the coffee if you have over 40 degrees celsius in, in the in the mass and that happens very fast in 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 a, in anaerobic process because there's no oxygen of course and, and as the um the the uh, the coffee is fermenting it, it's really uh, increasing its temperature um you know there's there's some people um including like fruits and, and some some things in, into the to the fermentation tanks as well um there's there's a lot of experimentation going on everybody these days wants to get more money for their coffee and of course when they see the prices that uh, some of these coffees are fetching at, at especially at auctions then they all get excited and they all want to do it uh, but it's it's not easy and it's not cheap to, to do it um, so of course we need to continue educating farmers on how to properly do these processes but you name it, you know, there's there's all sorts of things going on here. Um, there's a there's an interesting farm in in uh, in Cauca that has developed this huge uh, plant to do all sorts of different processes. Uh, it's called Finca El Paraíso, and they were, if I'm not mistaken, number ten a couple of years in Cup of Excellence. And actually, the coffee fetched the highest price in the Cup of Excellence auction, even though it was number ten, because. There's lots of buyers willing to pay ridiculous prices for those coffees. Um, so th there's a lot of investment going on, which is which is great to see. But of course, we we need to make sure that they're doing it properly because sometimes the result of those anaerobic processes is some really awful tasting coffee. Um, so you know, yeah. ex experimentation and innovation is great, but we we need to do it right. Yeah. And yes. if I may add to, to Alejandro, something that is a, that we've learned that it seems to be a very Colombian trend is indeed uh, the experimentation with uh, with fruits. Um, that it, it is uh, either with uh, like doing some notes of, uh, for instance, to orange, to leech, uh, to leeches, to cardamom, and then either it is the, the uh, additives, as uh, Alejandro mentioned, that is, uh, for instance, the peel of, of, of the of the orange uh, could be in the drying process or could be even in the fermentation uh, process, but also just uh, uh, controlling, mon monitoring uh, the fermentation, trying to get the specific notes. But probably indeed uh, the, the, the most ex exotic, uh, probably that uh, at least for lately is this, uh, looking into these spices, uh, uh, additives, uh, uh, that is uh, apparently very, uh, very much a trend uh, uh, for Col for specific for Colombia. Wow, I haven't done any of that. I'd be curious. <laughs> um, uh, I have another question from Los Cafes del Arriero. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that correctly. Apologies. So, what do you guys think about Colombia leaving the sea market, as mentioned by the president of the FNC? Maybe we'll come to you first, Floor, on this one. I think your mic is on, um, on mute. Yeah, got it. Uh, this is a, well, this is, a, of course, an open invitation to rethink the 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 pricing for for coffee and then it comes from a very core uh, a idea and that is uh, that uh, the most important uh, well the most important or the greatest uh, challenge for the sustainability of coffee is that it the, that it is a future for for the coffee growers uh, and that that is touching upon also what Alejandro was mentioning earlier if if you uh, as a coffee grower now and and it's just a, a, a population that is aging don't cannot make a, a living from coffee then uh, the how the future generation is going to jump in a, in a jump in a business that is not uh, having a future mm -hmm. so it, it is uh, Per, it's it's a daring invitation to disconnect from the new York market. Um, also, because what we have seen is that in fact there are many uh, occasions, and that more those occasions, uh, more well, there are more and more that it is not the supply and demand the ones that are determining uh, the fluctuations of the sea market, but some intervention of uh, investment funds. So we want to get back the control of 
of what is the coffee business and 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 this is one possibly one of the ways that it, that is that is really really uh, driven by uh, supply supply and demand and then always uh thinking uh, about uh, the profitability in for the coffee growers with all Ultimately, it would be the profitability or the sustainability for the full uh, coffee business in the future. There is, if there is no no coffee, there's uh, in the trees. Uh, there, there is no coffee to sell. Absolutely, Andrew. I think you had something to add there as well. Yeah, um, I know. I just like to make the the point from you know, obviously a micro roaster. Um, so we're buying relatively small amounts of coffee compared to some of the big companies. But I think. Um, for roasters who are focused on the specialty uh, grade coffee bean, this disconnect or this breaking away from the C curve happened years ago. When I'm when I'm negotiating a price directly with a farmer or with an importer, we say, well, the C price, the C curve is X today, and we believe this is so many cents differential above the C curve. It doesn't work like that. I cup the they cup the coffees and we agree a price based on quality. Um, so it's just it's interesting that at the, the, the higher ends of the specialty market, the C curve uh, price is almost immaterial already. Yeah. And that's the small little tip of that big triangle of all the Colombian coffees. Of course. Right. That yeah. That's yeah. the problem. Yeah. <clears throat> but I, I would also add um, that there is this exactly what Andrew said. There is. There's no longer one single coffee market. There's multiple coffee markets out there. You know, there's the commercial grade, which still follows the sea. Although you could argue that, in a sense, most washed coffee is diverging from the sea market. And how it is, it, it, it's doing that is by adjusting the differentials. So, you know, Colombian coffee used to be traded around 10 cent differential you know the last six months we've seen 50 55 cents differential so that's it's it's actually breaking away in a different way um in, in a sense because of course there's 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 no the, the the amount of washed coffee is not growing in the market we've got based virtually the same amount of washed coffee uh, produced for the last almost 30 years uh, what's growing is the Brazilian naturals and the, and the semi-washed, and, and the washed are not growing. So in, in a sense, you're looking at, at, at a disconnect that is, is slowly happening in the market. And it, of course, it's already occurred in the higher specialty echelon, but it's also happening in the, in the normal market because in reality, there's, there's, no, there's no growth in, in the, the wash coffee uh, market. And... Uh, that is the fastest growing segment of the market. It's a specialty. The specialty world buys mostly washed coffee. So, so you're you're see, already see, starting to see in a disconnect. And with Brazil now being able to deliver to the sea, it's going to occur a lot faster, in my opinion. Okay. Um, one, I'm going to take two more questions. They're flooding in, which is which is wonderful. But I'm going to just take two more. And I'm conscious we're close on time. We're over time, actually. Um, uh, Trish Ferguson asks, how do farmers make up the difference if they can't get or achieve the cost of production? What do they do if, if that can't happen? Claude, you might know this. Uh, well, there is, uh, there is uh, of course, the, the coffee growers don't focus only in coffee. So what, what we uh, uh, have and also what is recommended with the station service is that there is the diversification of the crop. Uh, so you would have uh, you have in your piece of land a whole a productive uh, ecosystem, and then or you, while you have uh, the coffee trees, you may have as well a plantain, for instance. That could be a natural way to give uh, shade uh, to the to the coffee trees, but as well, it is a, a source of, inc of income. Uh, you could also have, for instance, uh, a uh, beans that uh, take care of the uh, of uh, well o o of the preservation of o of the soil. Uh, that is also another uh, source of income. Um, so this is that just to to give some examples. So that there is uh, if if I even talk about my my own example is. Uh, Actually, it's in a personal note. My my family has a, a coffee farm in, in Quindío, and it is a it is actually one of of the regions that is a, plantain is one of the biggest uh, well 
products in, in the farm. So it's, uh, it's uh, this combination. So while it is the time to wait to, uh, to wait either for the crop or uh, indeed the prices are not good at the moment, then they are all there. there is plantain that uh, can help uh, give a, a bit of cash flow in the meantime. Of course, it's also the way to, to uh, a way to get uh, to get loans, and then wait later on for a moment where the coffee prices go up and then you have more of a, an inflow, and then can uh, pay your debts, let's say. But it is really about uh, living uh by the day that's uh that's what uh, what happens uh, in colombia with also the small holder that we have so doing the best you can with with as diverse a range of crops that you have <laughs> i would also add that one thing yeah. that happens especially in the smallest farms you know the ones that have half a hectare or, or one hectare is that they um the 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 the, the owner of the of the coffee farm will go and pick coffee for another farms or other farms surrounding them and, and maybe even the family so so they 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 uh, make up for the shortfall by by being being hired labor and when there is no harvest they might go out and, and work in construction in the main town or in, in the cities so they, they do have to f find ways of, of of finding or earning their their, their livelihood which the tears on the farm because they, they they can't be at the farm 100% of the time. So so it, it it's it, it, even though they're making money, the farm is suffering uh, because they they're not able to be involved in the farm as they should. Sure. So it's a constant challenge, really. I'm going to go with one last question. I'm conscious that we are you know almost 10 minutes over time. So um, it's a question to all three of you, and it's from Carlos Gonzalez Gonzalez. Uh, to all three of you, is it difficult to import coffee from Colombia? Overall, the costs of shipping prices or fees of trade. Do you know if there is any exemption of payment related to EU Colombia treaty? Does that make sense? Uh, actually, in green coffee, there is no taxes on the import in green coffee. Okay, Gonzalez, I hope that answers that part mm -hmm. of it. It's it's fairly straightforward. These days, you can do it even by FedEx or DHL. So you know, if it's small amounts, you can you can actually import coffee very easily using courier services. If there's bigger volumes, then you can work with an importer. And and a lot of importers, including ourselves, we provide import services for smaller uh, micro roasters that that want to consolidate their, uh, the coffee that they had arranged directly with the farmer. Uh, we can we can put it into one of our containers and, and easily bring it to the UK or to Ireland. Um, it's 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 very easy. And and if you look at the number of exporters that 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 are licensed in Colombia today to export coffee, it's easily like 500 exporters. It used to be in our time when I started in 2002, there there were less than 50. So it's exploded uh, a lot in the last even 10 years. Uh, and it's because, of course, the regulation has has become easier to to export coffee. But it's also because there's 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 a lot more farmers out there that are willing to undergo the whole export process. And and there's plenty of ways to do that uh, by subcontracting a lot of the services that that uh, that that you might require to export coffee. So it's become fairly straightforward. Uh, right. Just you know, just learn how to cup, go to Colombia, find some some good farmers, and that's it. Well, on that note, how about we all come to your uh, family's farm floor? How about we all uh, land there and uh, we'll um, taste some fine coffees all around the place and bring them back with us? That's the plan. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you very much. I don't have time for much more. Um, I've really enjoyed this talk. I'm, I'm uh, ever more curious now about Colombian coffees and I feel I, feel I, I know it better than a lot of other coffee producing countries as a result of this. I'm going to hand it over now. Unfortunately, we don't have time for all the other questions. Thank you all so much for typing in and posing some questions, but we're going to hand it over now and we'll wrap it up. And I'll say ciao for now. Uh, Patricia, your mic. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, Julia, thank you so much. Thank you, Alejandro, Flor, and Andrew for all the, this, this wonderful conversation. I guess most importantly, we all learn a lot and now we are even more curious. We know really well uh, what is really behind a cup of coffee. I just, I, I'm aware of the time. Thank you to all the attendees. 
we we consider very much your words that, that what you read that uh, coffee should never be free but as a special gift we would like to give uh, or to share with the the 20 of the attendees that will write to our emails uh, some samples of the best Colombian coffee that we have in Ireland so if you you wanted to do so we will do it and um, before finishing and uh, I would like just to give uh, just a couple, one, couple of minutes to uh, Angelica Camacho. Angelica is a trade expert from ProColombia and she will just mention a little bit of, on a couple of events that we will have on, on coffee. Angelica, you may join the floor and with this we, we end this event. Thank you so much. Thank you so thank much, you. Uh, Ambassador, and thank you all the speakers for, for today's talk. I think it was very interesting, all the insightful conversation that uh, we had today. Uh, as, as the Ambassador says, I work for ProColombia. We are responsible for trade promotion uh, of the country. We work very closely with the Embassy, and particularly in coffee, we have seen that there's a lot of opportunity in the Irish market. This is the largest export from Colombia to Ireland, around 17% of non-mining exports. Uh, we organize different events of matchmaking with uh, Colombian exporters, and also we help to identify and link uh, suppliers with buyers around the world, particularly in Ireland and the UK. We are having the um, coffee summit next week and we also organize different matchmaking events we're having another one in november uh, so please feel free to contact the embassy and throughout the embassy you can contact us and um, your interest in any suppliers or any particular products or in coffee uh, just with these specifications we can help you out with uh, companies in colombia uh, thank you ambassador all right okay thank you and i guess it's time to enjoy a good cup of coffee for all of us, Colombian one, ideally. <laughs> okay. All right, bye.